Have you ever wondered what games you should keep or you should lose? Find out here at Purge Views. Santiago is an older game, and just looking at the components, you can definitely see this. In this one, you're trying to get an irrigation system set up, and you're trying to control the water because you want it to uh, go where you want the water to go. And controlling the water is very important in this. You're going to be able to bribe people to get your goals accomplished, and sometimes you may not want to because you think eh, that person may want the water to go, the irrigation to go where you want it to go anyway. So this is a masterful Euro game, and it has a lot of aspects to it that are very, very interesting and unique to this day. This is by far a hidden gem that most people have forgotten, or if you're new to gaming, never knew about. Now, the game is a little nasty, and the bribing and the bidding and kind of et cetera is going off. Cutting all the people off is a great aspect of this game. If you're not comfortable with that, then this isn't really going to be appealing to you because you need to make sure that the irrigation goes in the direction you want it to go to. You want to make sure you're scoring the maximum amount of points, but that means minimizing what's going on with others too. So each round, somebody will be the overseer, if you will, and they'll be making a decision on where the water is going to flow to. And a great aspect of this game comes down to bribing that person. And you got to make it big enough where he'll want to take what you want or... If maybe they're going in your direction, you don't want to go at all, or maybe just a little bit to nudge him in your direction and kind of get a cohesive unit with him so you guys are building that aspect. Now, what's going to happen next round? That's all left for next round, right? So, it's a very good Euro game, but it is very brutal in that interaction between the players, and that's going to turn some people off. If you're okay with that, I think this game is really going to work for you. It does look outdated. The wood in it is very nice, but that's how games used to come. Lots of wood. That was considered great components. Wood, 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 wood. You don't see that as much. Now, you're a gamer a little bit more maybe passionate about the wood uh, components or a little bit more forgiving for it, for others, if you will. But this is definitely a game you're going to pull out and say, eh, I know what era this is from, and Santiago does that. But while it's a cutthroat game, and you don't see that a whole lot in Euro games, I know you do sometimes, but not a whole lot, this is one of the meanest ones. But Santiago is a game I love. So why am I getting rid of it? Why am I not keeping Santiago? Because the people I play with don't like the cutthroatness of it. They prefer games kind of where you're setting up your own things, but this one can be very brutal. In addition, I don't like the bidding mechanism, and that's a general general core of this game. This is, this is what this game is about, is this bidding thing. And I find that's too easy to bring non-gaming things into it. People have a hard time their first few plays realizing where they should be putting the money and where they should be bidding at. So I think this game almost rewards repeat plays, which isn't something I get to do a lot. So I bring out games I might play with this group over here and that group over there and this group over here. And sure, I've played it three or four times, but the people I'm playing with might not have. And an older game like this is even harder to get to the table. And I think this game is more rewarding when you have the same set of players playing and you start to understand the values of everything that's going on. I think the first couple of times you play, everybody at the table, the economy, what you guys are valuing things at won't come across yet. People won't really know when to accept, a little bit unsure about the values. So that's not going to play into our playing style or something that we'd have. This isn't a game really you want to pull off the shelf once a year or once every two years or every six months. You really have a few back-to-back -to -back plays to really understand kind of what the complexity of not just what you can do on a turn or the available actions, but the value of those actions. And for us, that'll be a purge, but that's going to blow the socks off a lot of gamers, and that might be you. So we're in Santiago the box. I mean, the box is not very appealing. You got this guy's face up here looking at it and a donkey. This is much more about what the game is, but the box isn't very appealing, but this was kind of what you got during the time period this was released. Inside you get a rule book, which we'll take a look at in a few minutes, and you're gonna get a board. And it's very, very bland, as you can see. It's just a bunch of uh, squares that you can set. Now this insert's pretty nice. You're gonna have paper money in here, and you're gonna have uh, three palm trees for a variant that's inside. Here's the canal overseer, which would totally be a miniature nowadays, right? You're gonna have little tiles that will come out that you'll be bidding on, and some cubes, and these are really, really important to be building the canals. Uh, everything fits in really nice. The insert is fantastic. The components, I mean, let's be honest, they're from a different time period, uh, but everything works and the insert works beautifully in here. And I think this is fine for this kind of game. I mean, if this was released today, this you know would not be probably cubes. The tiles, you know, had better artwork. You wouldn't have paper money, and this would definitely be a miniature. But you know, it works for what it is today. 
book. You're going to have a picture of components, which is great, especially for the time period. Now, the font is a little weird, a little small, but there's plenty of pictures and examples. Now, this part right here is going to just kind of explain the flow of the game, like important parts about the game. Then I'll jump in about how to play the game in a little bit more detail. Everything in red is like an example that corresponds to the picture. And you go through here. It's the end of game and scoring examples, and then the three palm tree variant if you want to include that. Then at the back is just a quick guide. You'll probably need a good 15, 20 minutes to read through this. It's a little bit of a, not too complicated of a game, but I would say by 15, 20 minutes, you'll be able to go through this and be up and playing in no time. So basically how the game is going to work, there's going to be tiles of these plantations, which you'll be bidding on. And everybody will be able to bid uh, money uh, to bid on the different plantations that you're going to have. Whoever placed the lowest bid will become the canal overseer, and you'll take this marker and you become an important part of the rounds. This will be the lowest bid, and you can pass and not bid anything, and you'll become the lowest. If there's a tie for lowest, there's a tiebreaker. But whoever has the highest bid will be able to choose whatever plantation tile they want first, which will give you more resources that you'll have during the game, and you'll be able to put these cubes out on it. So where the game becomes interesting, you're going to have these tiles out, and, and they will have uh, ownership cubes on them. Basically, these cubes will be on them, and you'll be able to uh, have ownership of these things as they go through. So what you're going to be doing, for the most part, is you're going to be building on these canal tiles that you're going to have, and you'll be bidding on where this is going to be played at. So you'll be want to put one of these out and say, you know, I want the canal to come through here. Because uh, I wanted to water my locations. So what you'll do is you'll put a bid out, and you, you, know, you only, everybody's going to bid one time. You put amount of money out. I'm bidding this amount. Now, if somebody wanted to add to that bid, they definitely could, or they could choose a different route. Let's say they wanted to go up here for whatever reason, and then they would bid over here for this. So you have a bunch of different bids. The canal overseer can now choose which bid does he want. Does he want to do what this player said, or does he want to do what this player said? And he can choose either one, pocketing the money. Now, perhaps he just wants to do his own thing. And if he wants to do his own thing, that's fine. So he can get rid of the two that was progressed and say he just wants to go here and feed his own. He would just have to pay $1 more than the highest bid. And a lot of the game is going to be about trying to bribe the canal overseer to do what you want. Now, if a location at the end of the round doesn't have water to it, the cube will come off of it and it'll dry up. So you want to be sure that you're able to keep the cubes on them by putting the water there. If the water was there, then it would stay and this one would lose any kind of irrigation to it. So as the game progresses, you're going to see these irrigation come out. You know, it always has to come out from where the water source is. But you're going to score points at the end of the game for having cubes on these location and whatever money you have left over. So one of the interesting parts about the game is that the money that you're bidding with is actually points to win the game. So by taking the overseer, by taking money from you, they're actually giving themselves points in the game, but they may not have the direction where they want the cubes to go. At the end of the round, everybody will get three bucks back and you do the same thing again. So you're going to play a number of rounds based on the number of players and you're going to score at the end for the money and then the cubes left on your tiles. And whoever has the most money or points in this case will be the winner of the game. Now, what, what I do need to say is that the crux of this game and what you're kind of doing is going to be bribing this guy. And a lot of it, you know, bidding on the tiles so you can get the tile that you want versus bidding the lowest and being in control of the canal. Uh, overseer is very important. If you need a lot of money, maybe you'll bid the lowest and this will be the route that you'll go. So it's going to be very important. He's going to dictate the flow of the water and he can make or break you in a game based on where the, where the water is going. So you can make it so good that he can not do his own plan. He needs to go to your plan because you're paying that much, but you're going to lose points for that. And what do you want to do with it? Do you want to uh, keep your points and maybe punt this part of it or do you really need the water to go your way? You usually need the water to go your way. So you'll try to influence, bribe the decision of the canal overseer. And that's going to be the main mechanism that's going in here. You'll be negotiating. Sometimes people will work, work with you. Sometimes they will work against you. But it creates a dynamic here that will be very interesting as you're playing through. And you're trying to influence. Now, every round, the canal overseer can be different. It might be the same person. But usually somebody else will be taking this on their own round. Uh, so you'll be trying to bribe different people. So what hurts you in one round may come back to hurt you further in the game or what helped you if you were able to get a deal and work with somebody, maybe that deal and alliance will work later on in the game. Probably not. What you need to do each round is kind of go for your, what you need to do that round, and people will usually play that way. It does take a little bit of negotiation and a little bit of bribery and taking that in to get the flow of the water the way you want. But in, in, in general, that's how you play Santiago. Who should buy this game? This is going to be an adult-only game. Uh, that's not because there's any kind of... Uh, 
you know, nighttime activities in the game. It's just, it's a very solid Euro game. It's a very cutthroat one. It's very mean. It's going to value repeat plays versus an occasional play. So this is a game that, it's not a lifestyle game, don't get me wrong, but after you play it two or three times, maybe within a month, or so, you're going to understand the values of the actions that are taking, and I think that's going to be more rewarding. So if you're somebody that's on a budget, you don't buy a lot of games, but you want one that's really good, that rewards that repeat play, this would be it. You also need at least three players to play this one, and sometimes I need a game that can be flexible with two or even solo sometimes, and this does not do that. So it's not going to be have a fit in my collection because it wasn't pulling, being pulled off the shelf enough, but... I can't tell you enough, this is a classic game that I think a lot of people are missing out on. And if you want to go back in the history of board gaming and find a hidden gem that maybe you missed out on, it honestly is Santiago. Purge for me, but that doesn't talk about the quality of the game at all.